Well, good morning. Our scripture reading this morning will be from uh, Galatians chapter 5. Uh, we are studying Galatians in the adult Sunday school class, and we've been, we've been studying this letter that Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia. Um, and we always start that class by saying this, something like this anyway, that this letter was written, like all the letters in the New Testament were written, to specific people at a certain time for certain reasons. Uh, and in this case, Paul wrote this letter to the churches of Galatia to defend the gospel that he preached. Uh, you see, some people had come in, some teachers had come in and, and said, you need to add on a few things to the gospel that you received from Paul, like circumcision. Uh, and so Paul wants to defend the gospel that he preaches and make sure that the Galatians do not trade that gospel in for another gospel, which is really no gospel at all. So our text for today is Galatians 5.1. Um, and, and that verse in most of your Bibles will be a full paragraph. That will be the only thing in that paragraph. But the next paragraph... Uh, helps explain and helps develop that point that Paul is making. And so we'll read that as well. So our reading is Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Galatians 5, 1 to 6. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand therefore... Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. So if you're able to stand, would you stand for prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, and as we sang this morning, everlasting God. Uh, we gather together today as your church, as your people as a family, and we gather together to worship you, and we ask that you receive our praise, we ask that you hear us and you are present with us here today, and as we gather, we ask and we open your word, we ask that you would open our eyes and open our hearts and open our minds and teach us your ways. And as we have come into this new year, into 2021, uh, we pray for your church, pray for this church, uh, and we also pray for our city and our state and our nation, especially as uh, we have a transition of government coming at the national level. So we pray for the leaders who are serving now as your servants. We pray for uh, those who are transitioning, who are coming into office toward the end of this month, and even some um, today or tomorrow. But more than that, we pray for your kingdom. We pray that your kingdom would advance across this globe, we pray for your kingdom to come and your will to be done 
We pray that the good news of Jesus Christ would go into the world, and we thank you that you loved us, and we thank you that you have given the free gift of your grace to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. And thank you for doing this while we were still sinners. Thank you that Jesus Christ has ascended and is at your right hand, and he is our advocate with you, and we pray that your spirit would be here today to be with us, to teach us, and intercede for us as well. So we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Well, the ESV uh, starts out this verse, uh, For freedom Christ has set us free. But the New, New International Version and the New, in New American Standard Version say it's something like this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now that is a verse that we can get behind, right? As Americans, we kind of like that verse because we love freedom. And we even like the idea of standing firm and standing our ground because we are the land of the free and the home of the brave. I don't know how many times over the last year I have said something like this. I'm so thankful that we live in South Dakota where we have our freedom. We have our freedom to gather and worship. We love our governor because she stands firm against those who would oppose our freedom and want to limit our freedoms. So we are a nation that is founded on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Freedom of worship, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom to do what we want to do when we want to do it. We are a free people. But Paul is writing about something different from that. He's not writing about political freedom. It's not about freedom of religion that he's writing. It's not about freedom of speech. It's not even about the freedom to have your restaurants open. Uh, it is much more important that it, than that. It is a freedom that transcends governments. It transcends the nation. It transcends every government in place. It is the kingdom of God. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So I've entitled our message today, Live Free in Christ. And our thesis will be, Christ has set us free so that we will be free. So that's really just a restatement of the first part of this verse. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And under that thesis, we're going to have three points, and like the thesis, they're all pretty much going to come from, right from our verse. So the first point will be, Christ has set us free. The second one will be, to be free, we must stand firm. And the third one will be, to be free, we must remain free. So even though this isn't the freedom that Paul is talking about, I love the freedom that we have in this country, and I think we all do. I hope we all do. But think about this. Christ did not come to set a free people free. 
Christ did not come to make a free people freer. Christ came to set captives free. And Christ came to set slaves free. And that brings us to our first point. Christ has set us free. Which, Christ has set us free, then would beg this question, what did he set us free from? Well, you could answer that any number of ways from Scripture. But I'm going to just kind of categorize them in, in two ways. I'm just going to talk about two of those. One is that Christ set us free from sin and the results of that sin. And then Christ set us free from trying to earn, trying to work for our own salvation. So Christ has set us free from sin and from the results of sin. So we need to understand this, that apart from Jesus Christ, we are not free people. So let's, let's bring that a little bit closer to home. Apart from Jesus Christ, I am not a free person. Apart from Jesus Christ, you are not a free person. It doesn't matter if you live in the United States or if you live in South Sudan or if you live in China or if you live in Galatia. It doesn't matter. Apart from Jesus Christ, you are not free. You need to be set free. You need to be rescued. And here's how Paul put it in Galatians 4, 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that are by nature not God's. And at the beginning of the letter, he wrote it this way. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself to deliver, he gave himself for our sins to deliver us or to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of God, our God and Father. And if you remember from our call to worship, Jesus even said it this way. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. So you get the point. We were slaves, but Christ has set us free. But when Paul writes, we are slaves, and when Jesus said, we are slaves, it's not purely an academic exercise so that we know the right answer. No, it's not that at all. These are God's words, and by them, he means to shape the way that we think. He means to shape the way that we view the world. He means to shape the way that we live out our everyday life. He means to shape, he means to shape the way that I think and the way that you think, the way that I view the world and the way you view the world. How we live, he means to shape that. So, is that how you see the world? That we were slaves until Christ set us free. So, so when, you, when you're out, on, out in Sioux Falls or wherever you live and you see people on the street or at work or at school or at the gym or wherever you go, do you see slaves? Let's make it a little bit more personal again. So, if you have a friend who's not a Christian, and, and I, I assume most of us do, I hope all of us do have people, have friends that are not Christians. So do you, think of just one of those. Think of one of your friends. Get that person in your mind. Get him or her in your mind. Now, when you think of him or her, do you think that, you know, that he or she, he's a, he's a pretty good person and he just needs a little tweak, just needs a little adjustment, just needs 
a little bit of Jesus? Or do you see somebody who is lost and hopelessly and helplessly trapped, slaved, enslaved to sin? Because that's the picture that Paul is giving us. Those are the, these are the very words of God. So, if you see your friend as a pretty good person, it probably means that before you were a Christian, you saw yourself as a pretty good person too. Right? This is especially true for those of us who have been believers for a long time or who came to faith when we were kids. We think like this. We think, yes, Jesus died for my sins. Um, and yes, I am saved by the death of Jesus Christ from my sins. But I don't really think of myself, I don't really remember being enslaved to anything. And by the way, um, all this talk about slavery is kind of offensive. Well, that's what the Jewish leaders thought. The Jewish leaders that we read about in our call to worship this, this morning. So, John 8, 31 to 36, or even 38. I'm going to read just part of that call to worship again today. Starting in verse 31. So, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We like that verse, don't we? And they answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say, you will become free. So that was, that was offensive to them. So I, have a, I wrote a little note in the margin of my Bible by that verse, by verse 33. We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? I wrote a little note there, and it just says, Wow. Because certainly the Jewish leaders that Jesus was talking to knew that the children of Abraham had been enslaved in Egypt. They studied the law. They certainly knew that they were exiles in Babylon. They certainly knew that at the current time, they were subjects of Rome and under Roman occupation. But it was so offensive that Jesus would say something about being free that they said we have never been enslaved to anyone so we need to see the world through God's eyes I need to see the world through God's eyes and so do you I need to see my friends through God's eyes I need to realize who I was as a slave to sin before I understand what it means that Jesus has set us free. So I was actively rebelling against God who created me. I was fighting against the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise God who judges everybody Fairly. I was guilty under his wrath, under the fair and just penalty of death for my sins. I was God's enemy. That's who I was. But Jesus set me free. So Jesus also set us free. 
from trying to save ourselves. Apart from Christ, this is what we do. We try to save ourselves. We try to justify ourselves before God because instinctively we know this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So God has put us in us. He has put in us knowledge of him and, and knowledge that we don't measure up. Knowledge that we are not right with him, and so we try to do anything we can to hide our sin, to cover our sin, to justify ourselves before God. So this problem is universal. It goes way back. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. Remember the story when, when Adam and Eve sin? What do they do? They cover themselves. They try to hide. And when God finds them out, they, they try to justify themselves by blaming others. That's the same thing that happens today. It has been going on throughout history. We try to justify ourselves. That's what we do. That's what we try to to do. So we're like, we're much like the rich young ruler. Well, except for the rich and the young part for me. But we're much like the, the rich young ruler who said this. And hear it again. Teacher, what good deed must I do? To have eternal life. Or we're like people who came to Jesus in John chapter 6 and said this, what must we do to be doing the works of God? That's, that's John 6, 28. What must we do to be doing the works of God? What do we have to do? So about Three weeks ago, um, Rob Plummer, who is a professor at Southern Theological Seminary, and he does something called Daily Dose of Greek. And he was talking about this verse, um, like I said, about three weeks ago. Uh, and he said this about their question that they asked. He said this about the question, what must we do to be doing the works of God. He says, this is the question of the religious human heart. What is it that God wants me to do? What should I do that would make me acceptable to him? But the good news is, Jesus answered that question in the next verse. He said this, this is the work of God. So if you want to know what it is that you need to do, this is the work of God. That you believe in him whom he has sent. So do you hear that? Jesus just says, just believe, that's the work of God, just believe in me, that is the work of God. And that sets us free from trying to earn our own salvation. But how did Jesus do that? How did Christ set us free? How did Jesus take slaves to sin slaves like me, to sin and rescue me while I was hopelessly and helplessly enslaved, while I was even dead in my trespasses and sin, how did he rescue me when I was the enemy of God? How did he rescue me when I was under a penalty I could not pay? Well, 
He paid it. He paid the penalty. He paid it all. Just like our hymn this morning, Jesus paid it all. God became man, lived among us, lived a perfect life, and his death paid the penalty for our sin. It was the appeasing sacrifice for the wrath of God, and not only for my sin, but for your sin and for the sin of the whole world. 2 Corinthians 5.21 said, For our sake, for our sake, God made him, that is to make Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We don't have to justify ourselves any more. Christ became sin, or a sin offering for us, and God gave us his righteousness. So I'm going to summarize Romans 5, 6 through 10. God did this while we were weak. God did this while we were still sinners. God did this while we were enemies of God. Jesus' blood paid it. He justified us. And it saved us from the wrath of God. And it reconciled us to God. God. And we all know this, these verses. For by grace you have been saved, and that is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one will boast. So we receive salvation by God's grace. It's a free gift that we can't earn. There's no way for us to work for it. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. So this is the good news. This, this is the gospel. God is the creator and our righteous judge, and we have rebelled against him, and we are sinners, and we deserve his wrath and punishment but Jesus paid it all. We can't earn it. We can only respond in faith and repentance. That's all we do. We don't pay anything. So if you're not a Christian, so and if you're not somebody who trusts in Jesus Christ, um, stop trying to earn your salvation because you can't do it. You cannot make yourself right with God. So if you hear his voice now or in the future, listen and turn to him in faith because that is your only hope. And I'd, I'd love to talk with you about that and I know that Others would as well. So I just urge you, if you hear his voice, turn to him in faith. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So what, what does it mean, freedom? What is freedom? Well, again, you could answer this a number of different ways from Scripture. But certainly in Paul's mind, he had these kind of things, the kind of things we were just talking about in mind. Freedom from being enslaved to sin, right? Freedom from sin and its results. Freedom from the wrath of God. But he also had other things in mind, like freedom from the requirements of the law. And not only freedom from things, but freedom to do things, like freedom to live by the Spirit. And freedom to live together as people with this one commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's from Galatians 5, 14, which, you know, we usually see that in 
in conjunction with the greatest commandment. But in, in Galatians, Paul just writes this. This is what you do. He says the whole law is fulfilled in this. Love your neighbor as yourself. And most importantly, if you're no longer a slave, that means you're a son. Those are the two choices we have, or a daughter. We're either children of God or we're slaves. And if we're sons or children, then we're also heirs of God. Now that is real freedom. Christ set us free so that we will be free. Second point. To be free, we must stand firm. And Paul puts it this way. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. So this is another thing that we love as Americans, right? Standing up for things. Standing up for things that we believe in. Uh, it's especially true if we live here. If we live in the middle of the country. We're proud to live in the United States because of our freedom and we love to stand up for our rights. We resist when people try to take our rights away and so we like this idea of standing firm. We even, we even stand up for the American flag the symbol of our freedom, and we get upset when other people don't stand up for it. That's what we do in the middle of the country, right? We'd love to stand up for our freedom. That's who we are. But again, this is not what Paul had in mind. Paul did not have in mind, stand up for your rights, he had this in mind when he said, it is for freedom that Christ set us free, stand firm therefore. He meant this, stand up, stand firm for the gospel, stand firm for the gospel that I preach to you. Specifically that gospel, stand firm for that, stand up for Christ crucified Stand up for Jesus paid it all, because that's what I preached. And this is the reason that Paul wrote this letter. This is the reason that he wrote it. This is what he wanted them to understand. This is, this is the takeaway. This is the big idea. This is the thing he wanted them to do. He wanted them to stand on principle, stand, resist any attempts to compromise. Jesus paid it all. So the threat to the church of Galatia was the people that came in and said this, Jesus, yeah, Jesus died for our sins. Um, yeah, he paid it for our sins, but, but there are just a few more things that you need to do. Paul says, just stand firm against that idea. Stand firm against adding things to what Jesus did. Hold the line and do not give an inch so Paul was speaking from experience when he said this because uh, earlier he had been to Jerusalem uh, to, to meet with a few of the apostles and some guys came in and they were trying to teach the same thing, tell him the same thing. And he called them false brothers who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. To them we did not yield in submission for even a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. That's Galatians 2, 4-5. to 
So in Galatia, the outside teachers wanted Christians to keep at least some provisions of the law of Moses, like we talked about earlier, like circumcision. Okay? And it's against that, against that specific thing, adding things from the law, like circumcision, that Paul says, stand firm. It's not a suggestion. It's not optional. This is a command from Paul because of this. He understood that what was at stake was the truth of the gospel. The whole gospel of Jesus Christ is at stake if you start adding things to it. He understood that if you add something to the gospel, you no longer have it. You no longer have the gospel. It's no gospel at all. You no longer have Jesus paid at all. What you have is Jesus paid some. And I have to pay the rest. Here's how Paul explained it from our scripture reading this morning, and I'm just going to summarize it, but this is back to Galatians 5, 2 to 5. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, four things, Christ will be of no advantage to you. You are obligated to keep the whole law something nobody can do. You are severed from Christ. You have fallen from grace. But the issue is bigger than than circumcision. It It was a big issue back then, right? But I don't think we're very tempted to say what I really need to do is keep the whole law of Moses. But what Paul doesn't want them to trade in and what God doesn't want us to trade in is the truth that Jesus paid it all. The truth that he is the only one that could pay it all and we can't add to it. We can't do anything to help with it. There's no price that we can pay Because we have been saved by grace, through faith, and it is not our own doing, it is the gift of God, it is not a result of works, but we gravitate towards works, we gravitate towards trying to save ourselves, we try to cover our own sin, We try to justify ourselves before God by our own effort. We gravitate toward what David De Silva calls ever-multiplying human-made laws. If you don't believe we do that, just look at what happens with our country, right? Ever-multiplying human-made laws. That's what we gravitate towards, and we do that personally. We gravitate toward thinking, my sin is too big for Jesus to pay. My sin is too big, which is really just another way of saying Jesus didn't pay enough. His sacrifice wasn't quite enough to pay for my sins. It wasn't quite enough to set me free. But that is not the gospel. That is what Paul would call a different gospel, which is, no, which is really no gospel at all. Jesus paid some of it is not good news. Jesus didn't pay enough is not good news. It is no gospel at all. 
Stand firm, therefore, stand on the gospel, stand on Jesus paid it all, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery, which brings us to our final point. To be free means, to be free, we must remain free. Notice that in our text here, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And, and like, stand firm. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery is a command. It doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean don't let anybody tell you what to do because you're free. It doesn't mean just be you. It doesn't mean, as we so often hear, you have to do what's right for you. It doesn't mean you can use your newfound freedom in Christ to do whatever you want, whenever you want. And Paul warns against this in Galatians 5.13. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. Freedom in Christ is not meant to be an opportunity to sin. In fact, living a lifestyle based on fulfilling all the sinful desires that you have is proof or evidence that you are not part of the kingdom of God. That's what Paul talks about in Galatians 5, 13 and 14. But freedom in Christ calls us to serve one another in love. And by that commandment we saw earlier, love your neighbor as yourself. So when Paul writes, do not submit again to the yoke of slavery, he has something very specific in mind. He wants the Galatians to be on guard against thinking that they can be saved by the law, and thus becoming again slaves, a different kind of slavery, because they were Gentiles, they were slaves to other things. And Paul says, don't trade in that kind of slavery for this kind of slavery. Don't become, don't put on this yoke of slavery that is the law, because if you accept circumcision, you have to keep the whole thing. You, got, you have to keep it all. The law had its purpose. The law was the tutor to lead us to Christ. That's what the law is for, to lead us to Christ. No, but it can't save anyone. The law cannot save anyone. No one is actually justified by the works of the law. We're justified by faith apart from the works of the law. The law is a heavy yoke that we can't live up to. There was, there was never a Jewish person apart from Jesus who could live up to the law. It's never happened. Right? Why would anyone put on that yoke? That's what Paul says. That's just another kind of Slavery, And so that was the threat to the churches in Galatia. The Jewish people, Jew, Jewish teachers had come into this church, or these churches in this region, and said this, the gospel that Paul preached to you is too good to be true. Jesus paid it all is too good to be true. To be true. The good news is too good to be true. Yes, Jesus died for your sins. Yes, you must repent and believe in the gospel. But you also have to do a few more things. You just have to do a few more things. But that's no gospel at all. So whether the people that taught this knew it or not, what they were appealing to 
was our inclination that, that we have to justify ourselves. We have to do something. We have to be part of the solution. And Paul says, stand firm against that. Don't think that you can be part of the solution to save yourself. You can't do it. So how about you? Has Christ set you free? And if so, are you ready to stand on the gospel? Are you ready to stand on Jesus paid it all? So I'm, I'm not really asking that as a rhetorical question. I'm asking you to really think about it. I'm asking you to test yourself. So when you hear Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, do you think, yes, Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. He paid it all. Or do you think this way? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. And so with my life, I just want to pay him back. In whatever small way I can. You can't pay him back even a little bit. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. Jesus paid it all. So as the worship team comes up, we'll conclude with this. Jesus has paid the debt that none of us could ever repay. He paid it all. And if you have faith in him, you have been justified by his blood, and he has set you free. And if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then you are an heir through God. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together and worship for the place that you've put us so that we can do this and worship you. We thank you that you loved us and sent your son for us to pay the penalty for our sins, which frees us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's uh, stand together, please, and sing step by step.